This video is going to uh, be a video lecture based on the, the slides for uh, Chapter 5 of Gapinski Healthcare Finance, and it should be fine for either the 5th or 6th edition, probably even for some of the earlier ones, though I don't have access to them. Uh, either one should be fine. Um, so we're going to drive through this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and switch my view here. Um, and we're going to go into presentation mode. Bear with me while I try to work all this uh, technology. All right, so <clears throat> um, obviously you're not in a group, but uh, take out a piece of paper for a second and jot down a couple of things, uh, a couple of items that a primary care clinic uh, would would have to pay for um, uh, to run uh, itself, right? So things that you would, if you were running that organization, what would you have to pay for? Uh, jot them down and we'll come back. All right, so um, we're gonna be talking about cost and expense, um, which are kind of two different things, um, but in this chapter and uh, and what we're going to be dealing with is the costing and profit analysis. So we're going to move from chapters three and four, where we were doing financial accounting, where we were primarily working with um, trying to create financial statements. Now we're going to start doing more analytical work to try to figure out whether our organization is running as effectively as it possibly could. So. As I mentioned, financial accounting uh, uses kind of organization level data. Um, it's really designed, it is formulaic, and it is designed in a particular, for a particular audience. And that particular audience is usually external parties, different uh, uh, lenders, such as uh, commercial banks, uh, it's all, or investment bankers, if you're trying to issue bonds. Um, but it is, it's highly standardized. Uh, it has to follow GAAP and all the all the other regulations. Um, there's a lot of uh, requirements. Managerial accounting uh, goes below the organizational level. So if you um, so you might go from uh, a hospital to the laboratory inside of a hospital. So it, now we're talking about uh, both organizational as well as kind of subordinate unit. Uh, data such as the cost of running the lab, the cost of running anesthesia, the cost of running the ED uh, in, a, in a hospital. It's designed for uh, use by managers. And an important point here is that uh, it doesn't necessarily have to follow external standards because it's not going to be generally speaking, it's not going to be audited. It's being created uh, for use inside the organization. So there's less scrutiny on how it is exactly done. Um, it's intended to be forward-looking, but of course we have to use historical data to tell where we've been uh, in order to think about where we're going. Um, and yeah, so let's see. So cost measurement uh, is a critical part of, of managerial accounting. Um, and this whole subfield we're going to be talking about is cost accounting. Now, there's a lot of different ways to think about a cost, and we've got, we're going to talk about a number of them. Uh, and so let's just dive straight into that. So the, for our purposes, we really want to discern between fixed and variable costs. Um, and the kind of the relationship between those two is called the cost structure. Um, and it, when you understand the cost structure, you start to understand how profits um, uh, are affected by decisions that managers make. Um, it, some, of the cost, uh, some of the costs are driven uh, by volume and some of them are independent of volume. So those that are independent of volume uh, are called fixed and those that vary uh, and are tied to changes in volume are called variable. Um, and then we have semi-fixed, 
uh, which I'm not going to get into in this lecture, uh, but they're kind of, I like to think of them as kind of lumpy um, because they're fixed over a range of volume and then suddenly they jump up. Um, so for example, maybe you can do uh, 10,000 visits a year uh, with uh, uh, a certain size space, but if you wanna go above 10,000 that you hit a limit you just can't push any more patients through. So then you have to add on space. Well, when you add on space, um, the additional space is semi-fixed in the sense that maybe that add-on space can only be added on in volumes that would handle 10,000 patients. So suddenly you have uh, another space, an add-on space that it, the cost of which is going to be fixed, right? Because it's say rented um, for 10,000 more visits. So it's lumpy in the sense that you add on space in units that um, accommodate uh, 10,000 visits at a whack. So if you're anywhere between, say, you know, 10,001 visits and um, 19,999 visits, your, your, your costs are fixed. But as soon as you go over 20,000, you've got to add on yet another unit of space. Hopefully that helps. Um, so uh, some ground rules about fixed and, and variable costs. Um, it said that in the long run, all variable costs, excuse me, all costs are variable. So to think about that, uh, and in the short run, uh, say for one year, uh, uh, many costs are um, also, uh, sorry, many costs are, that could be variable uh, become fixed. So for example, um, rent is typically treated as a fixed cost. Why? Because you have a, a lease, at least typically at least for a year. Um, so your rent uh, cost, uh, rent expense is a cost that's fixed. Um, but if you look at it in the long term, say five years, well, then you can flex your rent, right? You can change, you can get a new lease, you can move buildings. And so then it kind of, then your rent becomes variable, meaning you can, you can change it, you can flex it, based on expected volumes. But you know, in a short run of looking at it, say over a month or a year, um, uh, your rent is probably best thought of as fixed. Uh, there's a famous economist um, who used to say, in the long run, we're all dead. Um, when people would talk about, um, you know, his, his big fixation was in the short, uh, was on short run and making short run fixes. And so people would argue with him about, you know, his focus on short run stuff and his response was, well, in the long run, we're all dead. So it just kind of depends on how you want to look at things. Right. Um, so in this case, that's something to kind of keep in mind is it's all about your frame um, and your time horizon. So the longer your time horizon, the more of your costs will, will be helpfully thought of as variable and the shorter your time horizon, the more of your costs will be helpfully thought of as fixed. Um, also, nothing is fixed through an infinite range of volumes. And so that goes back to kind of what I was just talking about with, um, say, you know, being able to have units of real estate or real units of space that can handle 10,000 patients. So between zero and 10,000, I have, uh, that's my relevant range and my rent in that case would be fixed. Um, but once I go above the relevant range, above 10,000, my rent is no longer fixed. I have to add on additional uh, space. So uh, an example, a uh, question here. So what are some examples of fixed and variable costs, uh, say for an urgent care clinic owned by a hospital? So, um, the example I like to use uh, here in Durham is the Wentworth Douglas Urgent Care Clinic in Lee Circle, uh, which I've taken my kid to a bunch of times. So maybe think about the list that you kind of started to put together here at the beginning of this lecture and look at the costs that you wrote down and think about which costs would be variable, meaning they're linked to uh, changes in volume that the clinic has. So those might be things like supplies, um, might be, uh, um, in some cases, uh, uh, labor, um, and then fixed costs. Labor also kind of fits into fixed costs. It depends, again, on, the, on your framing and your timing. 
Um, but rent is clearly uh, a fixed cost if you're in a short enough uh, time run time frame. Um, leases on equipment are prop are fixed costs because they don't uh, unless it's like a, a lab piece of equipment where um, uh, your lease is based on how many how, on your volume, uh, in which case then it would be a variable cost. Uh, even though it's a lease, it would be a variable cost because there are some rental arrangements where, um, you know, particularly in the lab where basically you pay, uh, you pay in the form of reagents that, you know, get priced higher. So it kind of depends. Um, so here's an example of a cost structure for a walk-in, so a uh, walk-in clinic. So we have um, variable cost per unit. So for each, or excuse me, variable cost per visit. So for each visit, um, the clinic spends $20 in supplies and then maybe $5 in administrative supplies like paper and folders and things like that. So that a, the total variable cost per visit is $25. So if I see one patient, right, I generate uh, $25 in variable costs. If I see two patients, I generate $50 in variable costs. If I see three, 75, right? If I see 100, that's 2,500. If I see a, if I see a thousand, sorry, if I, yeah, 100. If I see a thousand, it's 25,000 and so on, right? Um, what about fixed costs? Well, let's imagine um, that rent is an associated facilities costs are $30,000 a year. The landlord wants to be paid his or her rent, whether you see one patient or 25,000 patients, the rent is the rent, right? And so in this case, the rent is $30,000. So that's a fixed cost because it's not associated with how many visits are being done by the organization as opposed to the supplies, which are directly connected to the number of visits. And then we give another example of um, uh, salaries. So we're assuming that the sal some of the salaries in the, cl in the clinic uh, are fixed. So that means that nobody's being paid on a, on a per visit basis. Um, and then overhead would be uh, costs step down from the parent organization. So going back to like the Wentworth Douglas uh, example, the Wentworth Douglas Urgent Care Clinic in Lee, um, that clinic would have a, its own facilities costs, its own supply costs. And then because it's part of the Wentworth Douglas system, a portion of all of the support that is provided by Wentworth Douglas's kind of back office operations, such as revenue cycle, the revenue cycle people and um, HR, right, that helps take care of the people who work there who are earning those salaries and um, anyway, other, other expenses that are provided, other expenses that are incurred at the bigger parent organization level that are then allocated uh, to subordinate activities like the, the, um, the walk-in clinic out there uh, by itself at Lee Circle. So, to generally speaking, we're only going to deal with in this chapter with variable and fixed costs. So all our problems are going to be around that. So what we have here um, is, you know, looking at how costs change based on volume. So we go from one to 100 to 200, so forth, down to 25,000. So looking at fixed costs, by definition, they're fixed, right? So um, I at one visit, the fixed costs are 300,000, right? That's the facilities, the salaries, and the overhead. You know what, your employees wanna be paid whether you're good at getting visits in the door or not, right? Your secretary, your front desk people, they're like, we don't care how many people came. I mean, they may care, but, you know, but because they want the organization to be successful, but they get paid, you know, an hourly rate, uh, whether they deal with one patient or 20 patients. So fixed costs are, are independent of volume, right? And then uh, variable costs vary exactly with volume, in this case, uh, at $25 per visit. So we already kind of went through that. So 25,000 visits gets us um, $625,000 in variable costs. When we look at um, total costs, 
uh, we're going to sum the fixed costs and the total costs. So if we see one patient, um, we're going to incur all of the fixed costs, right? We're still going to have to rent the building, hire the people, and pay the overhead to the, to the mothership. Um, and then we're also going to incur one unit of variable costs at $25. So taking care of that one patient is going to cost us $300,025, which is a lot of money. Um, and then, it, you know, what you can see is um, it keeps going up, uh, but it goes up. Uh, it starts at 300 and goes up from there, right? Um, what's interesting is if you think about um, average costs. So what's an average cost? Well, you take the total cost and you divide it by the volume. So if we see one patient, it's 300000 25. If we see two patients, that's 150,012, right? If we see three patients, it drops to 100,008 per visit. Now, these are not, you know, uh, uh, viable numbers of, of visits. Um, uh, but as we increase the number of visits, what we're doing is we are, sp the, 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 the variable cost keeps growing, right? but we're actually shrinking um, or sharing over a larger volume the amount of fixed costs. Now that fact is actually what drives a lot of um, healthcare consolidation today. It's expensive, healthcare organizations, especially hospitals, incur huge fixed costs. Think about that big, big building that they're located in. Think about all the personnel that it takes to run an HR division, to run a finance uh, operation, to run, you know, your um, facilities, to run your uh, uh, purchasing and so forth. So if many of those assets, many of those resources um, are relatively fixed with respect to volume, uh, to the volume of labor, uh, excuse me, the volume of uh, business that you're bringing in. Also think about, you know, the really big costs are things like EHRs. They have, in order for a, a healthcare organization to be profitable, they have to try to spread their fixed costs over as many, uh, as much volume as they possibly can. So a lot of the, um, horizontal mergers that we see between say relatively similar size organizations. So here in New Hampshire, um, looking at uh, uh, merger, the mergers up in the North country between those four small hospitals, those four critical access hospitals, uh, looking at the merger between um, Southern New Hampshire uh, healthcare and the Elliott, which are two relatively similar size organizations. Um, those are horizontal mergers uh, where basically we're coming, th those organizations are coming together um, to try to, to reduce the amount of fixed costs uh, and then for what's left, share those fixed costs across a larger volume. So if you merge the Elliott um, with Southern New Hampshire, for example. So these are, for those of you not from New Hampshire, um, those are two medium-sized community hospitals. Um, if you merge those two together, you don't need a full independent finance operation for both. You don't need a full independent HR division for both. So you can eliminate some of the expensive overhead and reduce fixed costs, and then you can spread what's left, right? So if you can bring um, uh, two of those uh, two departments together, um, so uh, two standalone HR departments and bring them together and then cut one of them even by 50%, you're now providing um, uh, the same level of support um, with 25% less resources, but you're spreading it over uh, uh, that same original volume. So 
let me draw, let me see if I can switch. Um, so if I have some amount of fixed cost, and this is my number of visits, right? So let's say I have uh, 1 million in fixed cost. At one visit, my average fixed cost is 1 million divided by one or 1 million, right? At two visits, it's now uh, 500,000. At three visits, it's 333,000. You know, at four, it's 250. At five, it's, um, you know, 200. And so what you have is uh, an exponentially decreasing average uh, 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 cost per uh, visit or admission or scan or whatever your appropriate um, uh, perspective is for your for your organization. So the more, right, the bigger the number of visits you can uh, generate or the larger the volume, your fixed costs are then spread over more and more. So eventually you wind up with, you know, if you do a million visits, right, it becomes $1 per visit in fixed costs. So you go from having a million dollars um, uh, for one visit, or if you have a million visits, $1 per visit uh, charged to your fixed costs. All right. So um, let me see if I can switch back. Now, the um, variable costs increase by $25 per. So you're never going to eliminate your variable costs no matter how many visits you do. But as you start to eliminate the number of, um, or excuse me, as you reduce the um, average fixed cost per unit, you will gradually approach um, your variable costs. So in the example I was just working through, um, when you reach a, you know, when you first start, uh, you had a million dollars in fixed costs and $25 for variable cost. As you approach the logical end of, you know, a million visits, you're now at a, a dollar um, per, per visit in fixed costs. You're still going to have $25 in variable cost per visit, but the average cost is going to approach 26, you know, at that point is going to be uh, approaching uh, $26, right? Uh, because you've now spread uh, all those, all those costs. So the average cost is going to fall uh, to, you know, almost to um, uh, the variable cost because you've spread the fixed cost so thin over so many visits. So uh, an example here, uh, at 5,000, at a volume of 5,000, we had 300,000 in, in fixed costs, a variable cost rate of $25. Uh, so our total variable costs um, were 25 times 5,000 is 125,000. So the total cost of providing 5,000 visits is the 300,000. The 300, plus the, the 300,000 in fixed costs, plus the 125,000 in variable costs, gives you that total of 425,000. To get the average cost per visit, you divide 425,000 by 5,000, that gives you 85. If you double your volume, your fixed costs don't change, assuming you're in the relevant range. Your variable cost rate doesn't change. So your total variable costs are now 25 times 10,000 or 250,000. Your total costs are your fixed variable cost at 300 
plus the new 250,000 in variable costs gives you 550,000. When you divide 550,000 by 10,000, you get an average cost per visit of 55,000. So what you can see is as you are increasing your volume, so in this case from five to 10, what you're doing is you're driving, you're uh, spreading the fixed cost and you're gradually approaching uh, your variable cost rate um, with the average cost per visit. So what does this look like if we draw it? Um, so this is the beginning of our cost volume profit analysis. Now let's think about this. If I have uh, fixed costs, so uh, let's see real quick. The, on the, the y-axis is our cost in dollars. The x-axis is the number of visits. So if, you know, I've got zero visits, one visit, two visits, you know, a thousand visits and so forth moving out to the right. So in terms of fixed cost, fixed is fixed, right? It's not changing with respect to the number of visits, it's going to be 300,000, right? At zero visits, at 1,000 visits, at you know 10,000 visits, assuming we're in the relevant range. So the fixed cost line is gonna be a straight line. Variable costs, however, start at zero because if you don't see any patients, then you don't incur any costs, right? But if you see one patient, you incur whatever the variable cost is per visit. So with the example we were working on, it was $25 per visit. So at one visit, we'd have 25. At two visits, we'd have 50. At three visits, we'd have 75, right? So, and so on. So it's always going to be going up at a rate of 25. Or in other words, the slope of this line is going to be $25 per visit, right? Um, so combining our variable costs and our fixed costs gets us total cost. Because, so remember, to see one patient, we have to, in order to open the doors and see that first patient, we have to pay our lease, we have to hire employees, um, we have to pay the overhead. Uh, so we're gonna pay that 300,000 uh, to, to open the doors. And then for every additional patient, for every patient we see, we have to, inc we're going to go 300,000 plus 25, 300,000 plus 50, 300,000 plus 75, and so on. You know, as we're out here at 1,000 visits, it's 300,000 plus um, uh, $25,000 in variable costs. So the, the gap between total cost and variable cost here is going to equal the variable cost here, right? So the gap here is going to equal the gap here. The fixed cost create essentially becomes uh, a y-intercept uh, and tells us where to begin to draw the total cost line. And the total cost line is going to be parallel to the to the variable cost line, um, coming out of uh, coming off of where the fixed cost uh, where where the fixed cost amount is on the y-axis. So as I mentioned, we're going to do, we're going to look at some basic profit analysis called cost volume profit or CVP. Um, and it's a technique to basically uh, play around with and try to figure out the effects of different volumes on our, our costs, our revenues, and our profits. So why is this uh, valuable to you as a health services manager? Take a second to think about that. So why is it valuable? Well, well, we have to be able to make some projections about uh, uh, the reality that we're dealing with, right? We have to be able to say, um, you know, is, is our proposal to uh, expand a clinic worth doing? And we have to understand, well, you know, what would that expansion incur in terms of fixed costs? What would that expansion incur in terms of variable costs? Would it change any of our uh, existing uh, cost structure. So that's, you know, it's a useful tool. It's, it's relatively simple and straightforward and it's useful for kind of starting to estimate uh, and make decisions. So uh, here's an example. 
Atlanta Clinic has forecasted 75, uh, this data based on 75,000 visits. So they expect to have 4.9 million in fixed costs, variable costs of 2.1 million for a total cost of seven, a uh, little over 7 million. Um, so what is the variable cost rate? So how would you get variable cost rate? Well, um, you take the variable costs and you spread them or over the 75,000 to get an estimate of what that would be. So in this case, now you take total variable cost divided by volume, 2.1 million divided by 75,000. And you're gonna estimate that we spend on average about 28.18 per visit. So that gives us an estimate of what our variable costs are. So what is the cost structure? Okay, so the cost structure is, is, tries to answer where do our total costs come from? And our total costs are the sum of our fixed costs, which don't change, and our total variable costs, which change depending on how much volume we estimate. So we were looking at uh, 75,000 visits, but what if we drop from 75 to 70,000? Well, now, we have um, our fixed costs of 4.9 million, but a lower variable, total variable cost of 1.9 million for a total of 6.9 million. Um, so we can look at you know, different, uh, possibilities uh, ranging around uh, what we think is most likely. So we could try to say, all right, we think that we'll have 75,000 and that becomes our base case. And when we can do kind of what if scenarios, once we've built this formula, we can do what if scenarios to say, well, what if we actually get 70,000 um, visits? How much would it cost to provide the care? What if we get 80,000 visits? how much would it cost on average to provide the care? And you can see that there's a significant difference here, right? It goes from 99 to 94 to 90. Um, why do we care? Well, what if um, our uh, 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 revenue per visit for this particular kind of care was $98? Well, we wouldn't want to do uh, care, do this care, if uh, we were going to have a volume of only 70,000, right? Because our costs would exceed the revenue that we got per unit. But if we could guarantee that we'd have a 75 or 80,000, then it might be worth doing depending on what margin we need. Uh, we need. So, uh, kind of testing our thinking here. What happens to the average cost per visit as volume increases? Um, well, we know, we've already talked about this, what happens to average cost? Well, it decreases, and it decreases not because variable cost is changing, right, because we're getting to an average cost per visit. Variable cost stays the same. It's going to be 25 or whatever our estimate was if this one was... Um, we were saying was 28, right? So in this case, it's 28. So it doesn't change. That doesn't change. What changes is we're dividing uh, our fixed cost by a, an increasing volume. So over as we achieve what is known in economics as scale, right, um, or achieve economies of scale, uh, we see a decreasing amount of average uh, we decrease the average cost per visit. Um, so, you know, example here, you know, at $100, um, what would the cost structure look like? So, um, uh, at an average revenue uh, of $100, what would the cost and revenue structure look like graphically? All right, so let's look at it from a graphic perspective. <clears throat> 
So we already talked about uh, fixed costs, right? Fixed costs are always going to be portrayed as a horizontal line. And we, we do it, I, I usually do it, I think typically we do it as a dotted line because we don't care that much about fixed costs. What we really care about is total costs. What fixed costs helps us do is figure out where do we start drawing our total cost line. But so total cost is the sum of variable cost and fixed cost, right? And the gap here is um, the total variable cost. And you can see it's the, that gap grows as we move to the right as we increase the number of visits. Why? Well, because even at 20 2818 per visit, as we increase the number of visits, it's going to be 2818 times 1, 2818 times 2, 2818 times 10. 2018 times, you know, 1,000 and so on as we move out. Our revenues, so at, say, $100 per visit, our revenues at, at zero visits, how much revenue do we make? Zero, right? 100 times zero is zero. And then we get, at one visit, we get 100, at two, we get 200 and so on moving out. So whereas the slope of the total cost line is equal to the slope of the variable cost line, which is the variable cost per unit. So the slope of this line, the red line here for total costs, would be 2818. The slope of the green line is going to be the revenue per, per visit, or 100. Um, so what about break-even? What does that mean? Break-even means... Um, it's the point where our total revenue equals our total cost. In other words, we're earning just enough money that we're covering the cost of providing our care. It also means um, that we're not making any profit, which is not the kind of business anybody really wants to be in. Um, so where does break even happen? Well, graphically, break even happens where the total cost line crosses the total revenue line. So right here is where break even happens because that point means that at this volume, total revenue is exactly the same as total cost. And then as we move to the right of uh, total, uh, excuse me, as we move to the right of the break even volume, so as we move this way, total revenue is greater than total cost. And so when total revenue is greater than total cost, we have an excess of revenue over expenses as the, you know, as our income statement or statement of operations for our nonprofit would say, or in for-profit language, we have net income. We have income, right, positive income, when total revenues exceed total cost. Um, however, to the left of the break-even point, notice that the red line is above the green line. That means that for any volume, for any specific volume here, right, if we draw a line straight down from the total cost line through the total revenue line, right, the total revenue line, excuse me, the total cost line is above the total revenue line, which means that total costs exceed total revenues. And so we have this area is our zone of loss. So let me grab my little pen and see if I can write this. This is, is it going to do it? Nah, not going to cooperate. Let's see. Nope, still not going to cooperate. All right. So this zone here is the zone of loss. This zone over here is our zone of profit. So in a fee-for-service model, when we're modeling it based on number of visits, you want to be to the right of break-even because that means that your total revenues are going to be above your total costs. So let's see. Loss. There we go. Profit. I'm writing with a mouse. So this is... This is kind of unique. Profit. Oof. It's even worse than my normal handwriting. Right. Or um, the basic formula is, uh, so economists use the symbol for pi to represent profit equals 
total revenue, TR, minus total cost. All right, so profit equals total revenue minus total cost. So if you can keep that in mind, um, that'll be helpful uh, uh, for the rest of this chapter. All right, let me clear those drawings. Okay. Um, so getting into forecasts, we're gonna use a PNL, right? A profit and loss statement. And what that does is it uses both our knowledge of our revenues as well as our knowledge of our cost structure uh, to forecast profitability based on volume, right? So, so we can link together our knowledge about volume, our knowledge about, about revenues, and our knowledge about variable cost uh, to, to um, uh, make an estimate. So it, it looks like an income statement. It's not an income statement. Uh, as the slide here notes, we don't have to follow the rules of GAAP. Um, there's no auditor that's coming in to check this because this is purely uh, a management tool, right? So it, cost accounting is a management function, um, and we're using it to try to run our organization better. Our bankers don't really care how we do this. Uh, they only care uh, when we go to ask them for money. They want to see an audited financial statement done using GAAP. But in within the organization, um, Managers have a lot of leeway. Leaders have a lot of leeway in terms of how to calculate things. And we'll, we'll have some discussion around, around that as we move forward, uh, uh, particularly in the, in the following chapter. So here's our, our base case P&L for um, our, our clinic, right? So remember we said our base case volume was going to be 75,000. We're making an assumption that our av average revenue is going to be $100 per visit. So our total revenue is going to be $7.5 million. So this is kind of like, you know, your NPSR line on your income statement. I'll draw some parallels here to, the, to what we learned in chapters three and four. But remember, again, the, the, the process here is less um, formal. It is more flexible. And, you know, your organization may do it differently than this. Uh, I've talked with a number of organizations and they don't, and, and when they do a P&L, it looks much more like an income statement. They don't, they don't do it this way. Uh, but this is useful. Thinking this way is in fact useful uh, for um, thinking about uh, the relationship between profit and volume, and as well as allowing you to make some estimations when you change assumptions like, well, what happens if I change my assumption about the dollars uh, for, uh, you know, if I change my revenue assumption? Well, if you've built this model, particularly if you build this model in Excel, you can just go in there and change. Let me see what happens if I change it from 100 to 80. Uh, let me see what happens if I change it from 100 to 110. What happens if I change my uh, variable cost per unit from 28 to 30? Um, you know, how much, how much can I handle? And so all those, those, you know, processes uh, will play, a, you will play around with uh, when you're making your estimates, you know, you want to make a base case estimate. And then you want to say, well, what else, you know, under what other circumstances, uh, you know, what would be the impact of different circumstances? Uh, so here we have, like I said, uh, 75,000 visits times $100 per visit. Our variable costs, right, chain are also connected to the number of visits because it's, you know, this is our supplies primarily uh, at 28, 18 per visit times 75,000 visits. We then get what's called a contribution margin. Contribution margin is your revenues, your total revenues, well, your total contribution margin is your total revenues minus your total costs at a particular level of volume. You can also calculate your contribution margin per unit or per visit in this case by saying, well, what is my revenue per visit? What is my variable cost per visit? So then your total, your, your contribution margin per visit is 100 minus 2818 in this case gets you 7182. So you can, so total contribution margin is going to be total revenue minus total variable cost. 
And we call it a contribution margin because it's the contribution that it's making uh, towards covering fixed costs and toward ultimately towards profit. So profit is contribution margin, 5.3, 5.4, minus 4.9 or 5, you know, roughly, gives us uh, 419,000. So base case total costs um, are the sum of the variable costs and the fixed costs. Um, so uh, the average uh, per visit cost is total cost divided by volume or 94.41. Um, what happens to the average cost per visit as volume increases? So think about it for a second. What do we know? So what we know is as volume increases within a relevant range, as volume increases, we're going to do a better job of spreading our fixed costs. So we'll push down our total costs towards our, uh, uh, our, our variable costs. So we're going to go from, if, if we increase from 75,000 visits, we're going to be spreading the 4.9 million in fixed costs over more visits. The variable cost is going to increase uh, uh, in a straight line fashion at $28 per. So we're not going to have a reduction uh, in our, our average cost there because it's always going to be 28 per visit. Um, but that 94 will fall to say 90 uh, if we increase our, our volume because we're spreading that 4.9 million over more uh, visits. So uh, saying that the contribution margin is that difference between the per visit uh, revenue and the variable cost rate, right? So I just kind of explained that a minute ago. So you can take the per, uh, per unit uh, uh, revenue rate. So in this case, 100 minus the variable cost rate of 28. That gives you the 7182. Um, it is, like I said, uh, the contribution towards covering fixed costs as well as uh, profit. Um, one of the first things you're going to want to know when you start looking at a project is what it would take to achieve break even. You know, break even is not really our goal typically, um, though not for profits, you could argue is kind of like that. Um, you know, they're not meant to, not-for-profits should only make enough profit, meaning enough excess of revenue over expenses uh, to support uh, ongoing, you know, the, the mission. And so, you know, a not-for-profit hospital has to make profit, you know, has to do more than just cover its expenses because it's, it's going to have to eventually reinvest in replacing equipment. It's going to have to eventually reinvest in replacing its facilities. Uh, and as well as profit allows the, the mission driven organization to expand its mission and provide more care to more people, depending on how the board feels about that. It may, that may or may not be an appropriate thing for the organization to be doing. Um, so there's two kinds of break even, right? So, so break even just basically says, uh, how much volume do we have to achieve in order to get total revenue equal to total cost? And that's known as the accounting break-even, right? There's zero profit. Now, economic break-even um, says, well, you know, your hospital uses resources. Those resources could be used to do something else. Um, and so, and that something else could generate some profit. So you have to, you not-for-profit hospital should be generating a profit, right? A return on the resources that the community has given you, right? That's the nature of a not-for-profit. The resources that a, a not-for-profit hospital use to provide care technically belong to the community. So in a sense, the community has uh, provided you those resources and you're a steward of those resources. So if you, um, if you don't generate some degree of profit so that you can continue to 
you know, take care of your own organization so that you can uh, continue to expand uh, the, the services that you provide, you being a not-for-profit hospital or other not-for-profit entity, um, then maybe the community ought to take those resources and employ them someplace else. So, but mathematically, what we're going to do is with this is accounting break-even is just going to be total revenue equals total cost. Economic break-even, we're going to plug a wedge in for profit. And we'll do both of those uh, here in a minute. So what is the accounting break-even for Atlanta Clinic? So again, what we're looking for is total revenue equal to total cost. Well, if we know, uh, let me switch my view here. Um, <clears throat> so what we know is uh, it, for accounting break even, total revenue is going to equal total cost, right? In other words, um, the basic profit function is profit pi, right? So get used to me using that. Uh, pi is equal to total revenue minus total cost. In accounting break even, profit is equal to zero. So now I say zero equals total revenue minus total cost. Why is it zero? Well, when total revenue equals total cost, then total revenue minus total cost uh, is going to be zero, right? If we have $1,000 in revenue and $1,000 in cost, that's break even. Well, profit's zero. Okay. Um, let me go back here. So here we have total revenues are equal to $100 times volume, right? Because revenue is variable um, under fee-for-service. However many visits you do, you multiply that times 100, and that gives you uh, your, your, your total revenue. Your total variable costs are your variable cost rate, right, times the volume that you do. And then your fixed costs are what they are. So in this case, they're $4.9 million and some change. Right, so what V would we have to plug in to get um, total revenue minus total cost minus fixed cost to equal profit? So this is a relatively simple um, uh, algebra problem, really, once you've laid it out. Uh, so combined terms, 100 minus 2818 uh, V gets you 7182 V equals 4.9 million. Divide both sides by 7182 right? And you get 69,165. So this organization, in order to break even, has to do um, uh, 69,165 visits. Now, that's not what they want to do, right? They want to make a profit. Um, but in order to achieve accounting break even, um, they have to hit 69,000. So that's a useful number to know as a manager, right? Because you know, if you can't achieve uh, that 69,000, then, you know, at this point, there's really no point in further discussion. If you know that the most you'd ever do is maybe 50,000, then you'd say, you know what, uh, let's wrap this up right now and, um, you know, look at a different project, right? So that, that's, that's what really what break-even is useful for is um, just kind of a first blush look at whether a business proposal is a good idea or not. Um, much later in the text, so like around chapter uh, uh, nine, we start getting into kind of the finer details of, uh, of evaluating projects in terms of, you know, their, their return on investment. So it's like calculating a percent return or, um, uh, or some other measures. But for right now, we're just going to look at break even. We're going to, we're going to just leave it at that. So, um, don't want to advance. So um, the break-even can also be looked at as a contribution margin, right? Because um, uh, when we, let me scoop back here, when we consolidated terms, when we said, uh, you know, 100V uh, minus 2818V, 
uh, is equal to 7182V, well, that is the contribution margin, right? Um, and so we had the contribution margin um, per visit times the number of visits equals um, the uh, fixed cost. So, you know, just quick back of the envelope kind of calculation. If you know that's going to be true, then you can say, well, break even is, is going to be fixed cost divided by contribution margin per unit. And that'll, that'll tell you what the break even volume needs to be. All right, so kind of putting numbers on our graphical analysis now, we know that, right, break even is where the total cost line crosses the total revenue line, where the two lines, where the two lines cross, it means that uh, the, uh, the revenue and cost are equal. And so that number for this particular example is 69,165. Well, okay, so, that's accounting break even. What about economic break even? So we, so I was saying a minute ago, you know, the people of, um, you know, uh, uh, of your community, if you're working at a not-for-profit or entity, uh, have contributed to your organization uh, the capital that you work with. Well, they expect you to do better than break even in order to continue to support yourself and you know remain sustainable as an as an organization. Um, so maybe uh, your economic break even is you have to generate a level, uh, a, a profit level of $100,000. Um, so as opposed to the accounting break even where, the, where total revenue equals total cost, with accounting break even, when you subtract your total cost from your total revenues, uh, you want to have $100,000 left over. And this is an example. You can set that number to whatever uh, your, your organization needs to generate in order to justify uh, its, sorry, continued existence. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, um, shortcutting here, instead of saying um, uh, uh, total revenue minus total variable cost, uh, equals fixed cost, we're going to shortcut and say contribution margin because that is what total revenue minus total cost is. Uh, total, total variable cost is contribution margin. Um, and then over on the fixed cost side, we're going to treat that profit like it's additional fixed cost. Uh, it's not, but, but what we're saying is we've got to generate enough revenue that not only are we going to cover our variable costs uh, and our fixed costs, but we're going to have some an additional, in this case, hundred thousand dollars left over in profit. Um, let me switch gears back here real quick. Uh, so, okay, so in this case, what were we saying? Let me write that out rather than using the shortcut uh, that they were using. My pen just died. Um, okay, so. Uh, rather than using the shortcut the book was doing, let's say that we've got total revenue minus total variable cost minus um, fixed cost uh, equals zero, right? Um, we know that, just going to get my numbers back here. Um, total revenue is 100V. Uh, total variable cost is 28.18 V and I'm going to put fixed cost over uh, on this side. And that was, uh, oh shoot. Um, 4.967462. Right. So consolidate terms here, and that's where you get the 71, um, would it be 70, 7182 uh, V equals 49674.62. And then we would solve, right? We would divide by 7182 on both sides. If we want to make this an economic, solve for economic, um, uh, 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 break even, 
then we want to change instead of this being zero, we want it to be a hundred thousand, right? And so when we bring that that fixed cost over, it's now uh, four point nine plus a hundred thousand, right? Well, that's so plus a hundred thousand. So four point nine um, uh, six seven yada is actually so it would be seventy one eighty two v equals uh, 5067, uh, 462. All right, so now we're dividing 7182 into 5. Uh, 7182 uh, into 5.06 million. And let me go. Um, Let me go back to my slides. So uh, at 100,000, we need seventy thousand five hundred fifty eight visits to generate that extra hundred thousand that we want as profit. Um, so again, the accounting break even is 69. Uh, the 69,000, the economic break even is, is 70,000, almost 1,500 more. It's, you, in order to achieve that $100,000 profit wedge, uh, you need to do 1,393 additional visits, right? So 1,393 um, times the contribution margin, which is 7,182, right? equals 100,000. So those extra visits uh, are going to generate that 100,000. So uh, here's a, so now this is where we can start playing with this. Um, you know, once we have this structure set up, we can start toying with it um, and, and working uh, different scenarios, right? We can do some scenario analysis. Um, so imagine that uh, a payer uh, currently contributing 5,000 visits wants a 40% discount. Um, should they drop the contract, uh, given that um, uh, that would be, they would go from paying $100, so a 40% discount would be, um, currently they, they pay $100, after the 40% discount, that would be $60. The average cost right now at 75,000 visits is um, uh, 94.41. So it seems like we ought to just say, you know what, uh, that's fine. Take your, if you, you know, if you have the market power to impose, you know, that you can just go someplace else with those 5,000 visits, uh, we can't, uh, you know, afford to provide that care because our average cost is 94.41. The problem is that average cost can be a little tricky, right? Um, because do the last do the last five thousand visits really cost you ninety four forty one per visit? So what do I mean? Well, what we need to do is think about what would be the impact on the organization if five thousand visits went away. So our base case was 75,000, right? So now we're gonna make an estimate with 70,000 visits instead. Um, and at 70,000 visits, we have uh, 7 million in revenue. Um, sorry, just need to check something. I apologize for little goofy delays. Uh, in my recording, uh, it looks like you're not seeing what you've been seeing my uh, whiteboard here for a bit. Uh, so I want to uh, get you back to seeing what you're supposed to be seeing. Um, sorry about that. Uh, let me back up. So 
economic break even we talked about uh you have to get that 13,093 additional visits um, so again, suppose Atlanta Clinic is confronted with a situation in which a pair contributing 5,000 visits wants a 40% discount, right? So now, um, uh, uh, you're going to receive $60 per visit. Um, so the question is, should we do that? So um, if we lose the 5,000 visits, we'll go down from 75,000, our base case, to 70,000. Well, we're going to get $100 per visit for the remaining 70,000 that we still have, right? Because the 5,000 um, that wanted the discount, have, we're taking those out of the equation. So we have $7 million in revenue if we do 70,000. Uh, 1.9 million in variable costs if we do 70,000 visits for a total contribution margin of 5 million uh, and some change. Fixed costs are 4.9 million. So we've got a pretty thin, we've, we're making a profit, but it's a pretty thin profit. Um, what do we do uh, if we add in, um, uh, so, so now we should look at the effect of the marginal effect of 5,000 additional visits, right? So our first line remains the same as the previous slide. It's 70,000 visits at $100 per visit. That gives us 70 million. Then we get 5,000 visits at $60 each, which generates an additional 300,000. So our total revenues are 7.3 million, which uh, the weighted average between of of for seventy thousand at one hundred and five thousand at sixty is ninety seven point three three, so we wind up with seven point three million in uh, revenues. Variable costs are remain uh, well; they're the same as they were when we run just seventy five thousand. Um, so we're back up to two point one million again. Total contribution margin five point almost five point two. Fixed costs don't change. They don't matter. It doesn't matter if we're doing 70 or 75. Um, they're still 4.9. So we're making a significantly larger um, profit. So in this case, uh, assuming two, 219,000 is adequate, you know, um, they ought to take it. Um, they're basically, they're breaking even uh, in, in accounting terms. They've, they've already passed their break even at 70,000. So if they can cover their break even, I think we said it earlier, it was around 69,000 and some change in terms of the number of, of visits that they have to do in order to break even. Anything after that, they just have to cover their variable cost, right? So in this case, they're making $39,938. It's not a lot, um, but they're breaking even. So assuming they don't have to take on any more fixed costs, right? We're, so let's say going from 70,000 70, to 80,000 or 70,000, let's just say from 70,000 to 70,001, right? Right now, don't even think about the 5,000. Just think about one more visit. Should they do one more visit? Well, assuming that they can go from 70,000 to 70,001, without having to build any more facilities or hire any more employees, right? That they have the capacity to take on one more visit without any change to their fixed costs, then how much would they have to charge for that one additional visit in order to justify doing it? It doesn't matter what the average cost is. What matters is the marginal cost or the additional cost they would incur to take on that one more visit. And that's what the word marginal cost mean or the phrase marginal cost means, is it means how much more cost do I have or do I incur to do one more of something? Well, in this case, the marginal cost is whatever the variable cost per unit is. So in this case, to go from 70,000 to 70,001 visits, it would cost the organization 2818. Right. So 
if it costs them $28.18 to see one more visit, how much would they have to charge to justify doing one more visit? And the answer is more than 28.18. That's it. 28.19 would be enough, right? Because why not do one, why not earn one penny um, uh, if you can cover all your costs? And that's kind of the logic behind a lot of uh, government payers, particularly Medicaid. Um, the pricing is, the assumption is that hospitals are covering their, their, their um, uh, or are breaking even on their commercial payers. And then the government uh, uh, beneficiaries, so people who are on Medicare and Medicaid, are basically just um, uh, uh, marginal payers, meaning um, you've already covered your fixed costs hospital, right? So you've already covered your fixed costs. And so all you have, all, all we have to do is pay you something more than your variable costs in order for you to uh, uh, see our, our, our very low uh, reimbursement uh, uh, patients, right? And that's true. And that's why uh, uh, hospitals take the lower paying um, uh, 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 patients, Medicaid, Tricare, um, you know, Medicare is better than those two, but you know, not by a lot, um, because they've already covered their fixed costs, uh, and they've already either broken even or come close to breaking even, uh, based on volume uh, that they've got with their commercial payers. Okay, so back to our. Uh, example here, sure, they should take those additional patients, assuming that they're not, um, assuming that these 5,000 patients um, are the best paying patients they can get, that there aren't 5,000 more patients that they could get $100 per at, because they might be like, you know what, uh, they, if, uh, you know, uh, it might make sense if they had to make a choice between patients that uh, paid sixty and patients that paid a hundred, they tell the they tell the insurance company, uh, no, we're not going to take your patients and go find someplace else that will take them. Um, but assuming, even assuming that, uh, as even assuming uh, these are additional, uh, which we're presenting here, even if there were five thousand other uh, patients that would pay a hundred, going from seventy five to eighty, if you could go seventy five to eighty without having to make any further fixed costs investments, then you should take them. In fact, they, this, this organization ought to be pursuing um, as many patients as they possibly can um, at any amount of reimbursement over 2818 up to a volume that would maximize uh, or max out uh, their capacity at their current fixed cost. Once you pass the relevant range and you have to make additional fixed cost investment, that's when you have to think about whether uh, you want to take, you know, whether you want to make those additional fixed cost visits, whether you want to expand uh, your fixed cost, you know, your fixed costs, expand your capacity uh, to take on additional patients, particularly if, they're, uh, if their reimbursement rates are very low. All right. So, um, Here's a different example, a slight variation on it. Um, suppose now that we're back to our 75,000, you know, our base case of 75,000, where we're getting $100 per, per visit for our base case, and a new insurer comes into town and says, hey, I've got, you know, maybe, maybe uh, Amazon HQ2 moves in uh, to your community and says, and, and Jeff Be Bezos is, uh, 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 you know, HR negotiator uh, comes to your organization and says, "Hey, uh, we'll provide, uh, we'll we'll direct our our five thousand employees to you, uh, or or however many employees. Then they're going to generate five thousand additional visits. So we're going to go from seventy five thousand visits to eighty thousand visits now. Um, but they want to pay you know sixty dollars per visit, that forty percent discount. So." Um, at eighty thousand uh, dollars, or excuse me, at eighty thousand visits, the average cost is ninety twenty seven. Um, 
uh, which is well below the 60, right? But again, we're talking about marginal or additional um, uh, patients, not uh, changing the rate of all of the patients that we're seeing, or not even a portion of the patients like we did before. So we're going to go from 75 to 80. So our lesson here is, what do we know? Well, we know this organization broke even at 69,000 and some change number of, of patients. So they've already broken even. So assuming they don't have to make any more investments in uh, fixed costs, right? They don't have to build a new building in order to accommodate these 5,000 patients. Then these patients are in that zone of, of you know, marginal uh, 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 revenue uh, where really all we care about is are they covering uh, the variable costs? So let's look at this. All right. So our base case, um, puts us at, uh, you know, this is our base case, right? So it puts us at 7.5 million, 75,000 times a hundred. Um, our variable costs are 2.1 million, 2818 times 75,000. It gives us a contribution margin of 5.4. Uh, our fixed costs are still 4.9. Uh, our profit is 419,000. So that's our base case, right? And so, um, when we add on these 5,000 additional uh, patients, they're going to bring in uh, $60 times 5,000, $300,000 in additional revenue. Um, and costs will increase from, uh, 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 variable costs will increase from 2.1 million to 2.25 million. So that's a marginal in increase, right, of uh, what is that about? 130,000. So we're going to get 300,000 more in revenue, but we're going to incur 130,000 more roughly in um, variable costs. So our contribution margin is going to go up. So we're going to have additional margin as a result because our additional revenue is going to exceed the additional variable costs we're incurring. And critically, we're not having to make any additional fixed cost investments. We're not hiring more employees. We're not building new buildings. We're just, we had, we had unused capacity and we're going to use that unused capacity to take care of these 5,000 additional patients. And what happens, we wind up with additional profits. So even though those 5,000 new patients were paying $60, which is less than, right, our average cost at that, at 80,000, um, it still makes sense. So average cost is not a good way to think about uh, whether you should take on additional patients or not. You want to think about the marginal cost. How much does it cost to bring in one more patient? And in this case, that's 2818. Once you have to start making uh, fixed cost investments in order to move beyond your current relevant range, right, to increase capacity, then you have to, it's a more complex uh, calculation. But if you have excess capacity, you know, you have slack in your system, uh, then it, you just have to cover your variable cost. So I've been talking about marginal cost, right? And in this case, it, it's the variable cost rate. Um, this is, you know, this is a relatively simple model. If we were doing more complex models, uh, the marginal cost wouldn't necessarily be that. But in this, this relatively simple model, uh, this is a useful way to think about it, right? So it's not, uh, so it's useful to think about and separate out my variable costs from my fixed cost because if you're already covering your fixed cost with your existing volume, then all you have to do is cover your variable cost to justify additional uh, uh, workload. So uh, the marginal revenue, right, the additional revenue that you're going to get off that next visit is 60. So the contribution margin is 3182, which is positive, which is what you want, right? Um, and so uh, you'd add 159,000 to the bottom line um, by adding those $5,000, excuse me, 5,000 additional visits. So how would this change? if you went from uh, uh, 
uh, if the proposal was expected to add 15,000 rather than 5,000. Um, and here we're saying the relevant range is 80,000. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm letting you think about it. Well, what it means is if you go past the relevant range, if you go past 80,000, so the, the, the base case was 75,000, um, and the relevant range for your fixed cost is 70 to 80. If you go beyond 80, you're going to have to hire more people. You're going to have to build a new building, something, so that your fixed costs change. So it's, it's going to be more complex than that. So it doesn't mean no, right? It doesn't mean you can't do 15 instead of five. But what it means is the fixed cost estimate that we're currently working with is not the number that you need to have in your model uh, if you're going to do 15,000. If you're going to do 5,001 patients, uh, you're going to have to uh, uh, change your fixed cost. Okay. So, so far we've been focused on fee for service, um, but we're also going to talk about capitation. Most organizations that I work with are not operating on a capitated basis. Uh, we have some risk contracting going on, uh, but primarily, primarily, most American healthcare is still operating on a fee for service basis. Now, you have a few organizations like uh, Kaiser Permanente that are running on capitation, but uh, primarily, uh, uh, American healthcare still runs on a fee for service basis. So, but capitation changes the way we think about um, uh, profit, right? Um, and our profit calculations. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna do a CVP now using um, the assumptions of, sorry, using the assumptions of uh, capitation. All right. So the lines look a little different, right? We still have fixed costs. So let's assume uh, that your hospital decides to take on uh, a switch to a capitated, uh, uh, capitated payment. Well, you'd still have fixed costs, right? Because you have a building, you have leases, rent, uh, or depreciation, depending on how you pay for your building. You, know. uh, you have variable costs. So even if your patients are paying... Uh, paying you on a per member per month basis, right? So they pay you a fee uh, uh, and, they, and, and then they get to use your organization as much as they want based on that fee. Every time they come in, they're, they're using up your supplies. They're, you know, uh, uh, doing other things that cost you money. So number of the fixed costs don't change based on volume. Your total costs still change because your variable costs vary with the number of visits. They vary upward with the number of visits. And, uh, but here's the, here's the real difference, right? Under fee-for-service, revenues, total revenue is the number of visits times the average revenue per visit. So it starts at zero and it goes up. Under capitation, you have a contract based on the number of covered lives uh, times the per member per month rates. So you get some rate called a PMPM times a number of members. So let's say you had uh, 10,000 members that you were covering and you would get, say, $10 a month. Your um, revenue would be $100,000 $100, a month or $1.2 million a year. So it would be a fixed, your revenue would be fixed just like your fixed costs are fixed, right? It's a flat line because the number of visits doesn't change the revenue. Your revenue is based on how many covered lives times the per member per month or per member per year fee that you get. So now what's different? Well, remember what you want to see is, you know, what you're, we're in the business to make profit. Under fee-for-service, you wanted to find your break even where total where the total revenues equal the total cost right there so that would be right here this is where total revenue equals total cost and under fee for service you wanted to be to the right of the break even because under fee for service to the right of the break even total revenue would have shot up like this and crossed the total cost line 
and to the right of that would the total revenues would be above the total costs but notice here we're here we're at the break even what's happening to the right of break even well it looks like the red line which is total costs is above the green line which is total revenues and so when total costs exceed total revenue you have a loss so this is the zone of loss instead of the zone of profit over here total revenue so to the left of break even total revenue is above total cost and so this is actually your zone of profit so they're flip flops right uh under under fee for service, this is the opposite. The arrangement is opposite. Under capitation, right? You want to be to the left of the break-even volume. All right. So, how does that even make sense? Well, the motivation under capitation is you're going to get some fixed amount of money from the insurance company, right? Or from a large employer as a provider. And they're going to write that check and they're going to say, okay, here's your $100,000 this month. Uh, don't spend it all in one place. Meaning, um, uh, you know, uh, it's up to you. This is the dollar amount we're giving to you. It's up to you now to provide the um, members that you have agreed to care for, uh, provide them the care you've contracted to provide under $100,000. So if you can keep your, if you can keep the num, assuming that cost is, is, you know, the cost per visit, um, the variable cost per visit is some fixed number, which we of course know it's not, but we're going to use an average here. Um, then your goal is to keep the, keep your, keep the members out of your, of your organization to have them not accessing care to have them not using care uh, because the fewer visits you have under capitation the more profit you make right so the wedge is wider here than it is up here so the motivation under capitation is to reduce utilization which in some sense is a good thing right so if if the reason that patients aren't coming in is because the provider is taking better care of them and you know looking out for their uh, preventive medicine and making sure they're getting immunizations and making sure they're getting all their physical exams and and so forth. Uh, so thus preventing more expensive incidents of care. Um, then uh, that's a good reason why uh, uh, the volume of visits is lower, right? The flip side of that, of course, is providers can just make it hard for people to access care, uh, in which case the number of visits is lower. But that really just makes patients angry uh, and makes them resentful of managed care, which is what happened in the 80s and early 90s and why there was such a big pushback against managed care is because basically, you know, these managed care organizations uh, weren't uh, delivering on the promise of improved health. Instead, they were just making it hard to access care. Um, so. In an ideal situation, providers are incentivized under capitation to reduce utilization, and they're incentivized to reduce utilization by, you know, taking better care of the patients to begin with, to providing, um, you know, greater value um, uh, uh, rather than just simply um, uh, well, under fee for service, the incentive is the exact opposite, right? Under fee for service, providers make more money the more times they see you, the more times you come in. So, in it, on the fee for service has a, you know, kind of um, uh, has an incentive to try to get you in the door as often as they can. Capitation has the opposite; it has the it gives the provider the incentive to have you uh, uh, not come in the door, uh, or have you come in the door as little as possible. So uh, on the graph, you can see kind of it's reversed, right? That's what the slide says. Um, you know, the idea is that there's this kind of perverse incentive um, uh, uh, because every time you walk through the door, the organization has to pay $28 uh, in, in um, uh, variable cost to take care of you. And they, by the way, don't get any additional money uh, from the insurance company, right? The insurance company writes the check, uh, and says, you know, here's your hundred thousand, uh, and don't call me and ask me for any more money. In reality, there are, are kind of escape clauses to that, but um, 
that's the idea. So, okay, so we've been looking at, this is another way to look at capitation uh, on a CVP uh, analysis, right, on this cost volume uh, 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 profit graph, right? And so the thing to notice here is we've changed the x-axis. Uh, the x-axis is no longer the number of visits, it is volume in the sense of the number of members, right? And so when we go to draw our CVP now, fixed costs are still fixed costs. Uh, uh, variable costs still go up with, they go up with the number of members. Now, why would they go up with the number of members? Well, the assumption is that as you increase the number, that, that members will make, will have some level of utilization say, you know, they'll use their primary care provider uh, three times a year or four times a year. Um, and so as you increase the number of members, you have an expectation of an increasing volume of visits, right? So if you go from one member to two members, you'll go from an expectation of four visits a year for one member to eight visits a year for two members if you have um, a utilization rate of four visits per year. So as you increase the number of members, you're going to increase the number of visits. As you increase the number of visits, as you know, we're going to increase the um, uh, variable cost because we have a variable cost per visit. So as we increase the number of members, we're going to have our fixed costs. They're not going to change, but we're going to be seeing more. We're going to have more visits, which means that our variable costs are going to increase. So variable cost plus fixed cost gives us our total cost. Now, total revenues are back to uh, being an, a um, uh, right, uh, uh, sorry, an upward sloping uh, line, right, where if I have a uh, zero members, then I get zero uh, reimbursement uh, for my revenues, or I get zero revenues if I have a lot of um, members, I get a lot of revenue. So this looks like the fee-for-service graph, right? Uh, and, and, and it's essentially the same graph, you know, in terms of where the lines are, but what the lines mean is a little bit different. So uh, now the profit and loss areas are the same as on the fee-for-service graph, right? Um, and so, uh, here we have an example of, so if, if our uh, per member annual revenue, so our per member per year is $400, right? And we see four visits a year um, uh, on average, then our revenue per member is 400 and our uh, variable cost per member is 112. So our contribution margin per member is 400 minus 112 or 287. So it's just a different, another, another way of expressing it. Um, so uh, what about the importance of utilization management, right? So under fee-for-serve, so what does utilization management mean? Um, well, if you're a provider, you probably know better than me, but uh, uh, you know, utilization management basically is an effort by the organization to to manage the utilization of the services that the organization provides. Typically what we're talking about here is reducing utilization. So under fee-for-service, what is the incentive to reduce utilization? The answer is, uh, you know, unless there's some sort of uh, other alternative contract running in the background, there is no incentive uh, to reduce utilization. There's in fact, there's an incentive to increase utilization you know, for providers to think about other ways that they can, uh, you know, other services that they can offer uh, to, um, to, to patients, right? Uh, so, you know, a dermatologist under fee-for-service is incentivized to offer, you know, cosmetic services, um, to offer, you know, other things, uh, and, and lots of other providers have, have similar kind of incentives. Um, under capitation, there's a really strong uh, uh, incentive for utilization management. Why? Because 
the fewer visits we get, the more money we get to keep, right? Because we're not, if we have fewer visits, we're, have, we're not having to pay variable costs for those visits. And so we get to keep, we generate more profit. We get to keep more money at the end of the day. Um, so what do the graphs tell you about the importance of the number of members under capitation? Well, if you're paid on a per member basis, you need, you want more members to generate that higher per member per month or per member per year, you know, times the number of members. So your total revenue is a function of the number of members. So you, under capitation, you want more members, but at the same time, every mem additional member you bring in comes with uh, an obligation to provide them care. So you have to have a really good estimate of how much care you're going to have to provide under capitation to know, you know, what the right number of members is. Right? Because if you bring in too many members and you don't do a good job of managing that care and, you know, and estimating the amount of care you have to provide, you might wind up having to hire more people, build more facilities and so forth, right? Um, and that changes your profit calculation completely. So the kind of holy grail is bring in of, of capitation is bring in more members and manage their utilization such that, you know, we push down their, their utilization while bringing in as many members as we can. And that gives us, maximizes our profit under capitation. All right. So that is the end of uh, uh, chapter five. I uh, 